All right. You guys ready to roll? Yeah. yeah. All right. If you want to follow along in your Bibles this morning, you're going to want to grab your Bible. Go to John chapter 9 is where we're going to be. We're continuing through the series, Journey Through John, uh, and we are journeying through John up to the cross. Uh, we're just doing some a handful of passages along the way here uh, that we're picking out. Let me start by just telling you a little story from a handful of years ago. I was on a missions trip in Eastern Europe, and uh, while I was there, I was there with actually all ladies. It was me and the ladies on a missions trip. And, uh, and while we were there, we got to, uh, it was a Sunday morning, and after church was over, some of the ladies went on outside. Almost everyone had left, and they went and they sat down on the concrete steps out in front of the church, to which someone came running, rushing on out, and they said, ladies, stand up, stand up. And they said, oh, what are we doing? Like, are we offending the, I don't know, the, the culture, the community, the church somehow by sitting here? And they said, no, 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 it's just that ladies in our culture, if you sit on concrete, you'll become infertile. <laughs> Some of the ladies were really old, so they were okay with that, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, they... While, while we kind of laugh at that, like, really? Now, for them, they, they might not have even believed that. There might have been some in their culture there who would have said, we know that's not true. We know that's not how it works, but it's still a cultural norm that we still practice, and here's the belief to it. Here's the, the belief behind the behavior. And here's the deal is that there are cultural norms in every, in every culture that impact our behavior. It impacts kind of how we act, what we believe, what we do. Um, uh, perhaps maybe you grew up in a, in, in a house doing this. Anyone ever hear of anything like this? Sit down to, to have a meal, and let's say you take a bite before you pray. I was at Bible college. I remember the first time that someone said, uh, I took a bite, and then they said, oh, let's pray. And he goes, that's okay. I'll pray for the meal. I'll pray for your food that you already ate that you won't get sick from it. <laughs> won't get sick from it? He said, oh, yeah, if you don't pray for the food before you take a bite, you're rolling the dice. I'm like, I have never heard that one before. He's like, oh, yes, yeah, what I always grew up. Maybe some of you grew up believing that or, or hearing that, which uh, I look at and go, well, in Jewish culture, that would have just been, everyone would have been sick because, you know, they didn't pray before the meal. They prayed after the meal. And they didn't pray to give thanks for the food. They, gave, uh, they praised God that he was the provider. Totally different perspective altogether. And so if you look at it and you're like, uh, there are these cultural beliefs and behaviors that we have that sometimes are not in alignment with anything biblical or scriptural or have anything to do with God at all. And so today, the, the phrase I'm going to keep coming back to is this, is that cultural perspectives blind kingdom perspectives. Cultural perspectives will blind you from kingdom perspectives and what God is doing. The real reality is that in culture, we're, we're born into a culture and our culture helps shape a lot of times unfortunately, non-biblical perspectives about God, his character, uh, how he works, what he would do, what he wouldn't do. And so there are these beliefs in every culture. I love our culture, but our culture has some realities in terms of uh, what it has taught us about who God is and how he works that are not related to God at all or scripture. And yet they've worked this way into our lives, into the core of who we are to make us and lead us to make uh, incorrect deductions about God or how we should even live. And so what we're going to do is we're going to dive into John chapter 9 here where a, a, a bunch of well-intended individuals make a whole bunch of incorrect deductions about God and what Jesus is up to because of their cultural perspective, okay? And so we'll get to see how Jesus interacts with these people and kind of calls them back around. So go to John chapter 9. John chapter 9, we'll start in verse 1. And this is really, it's an interaction that Jesus has around a man who ends up getting healed from his blindness, okay? So this is where it begins, John chapter 9, verse 1. And he, or as he, being Jesus, went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. This happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. So the first group of people we're going to look at in, in terms of their incorrect cultural perspective that they bring into the situation is actually the disciples. The disciples bring forward an incorrect perspective about what's happening here. And it's around their question. They're saying, Jesus, tell us who sinned. Did the blind man sin or did his parents sin that this guy ended up blind? Now, wh why in the world would they even have that as a question? Like, where, where in the world did they come up with that? You got to understand these are Jewish uh, 
individuals and Jews lived under the law. Everything was, how do we honor the law? How do we live by the law? How do we uh, stay in step with the law? And one of the things that the law really clearly states is all throughout is it's very common. It's this, this eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Uh, if my ox gores your ox, my ox is going to have to get put down. Just, it was just this, because there's a, a wrong, something has to be done to make it right. Okay, and so throughout, over, over history, what happens is this group of people, they see these things in life, like people who are blind or, or they're lame, and people make the assumption, Israelites came to make the assumption that they said, well, that's clearly not right, so there must have been something that was wrong. Somewhere along the way, someone did something that was wrong. Someone sinned that that happened. And so they asked the question, so Jesus, tell us, who sinned? Was it the parents? Maybe they sinned. Was it the guy himself that he would be born blind? And Jesus's answer just kind of reveals to them, guys, your whole question's wrong. You're entering into this thing with a cultural perspective that's off. He goes, neither. Nothing to do with anyone sinning. What, what this is all about, God wants to demonstrate his power in this guy's life. That's why this happened. This is all about God wanting to demonstrate power here. And as silly as that might sound, you know, who sinned that this would happen? I talk to people all the time who still wrestle through those same type of thoughts in, in their mind. They, they, they say, hey, I'm looking at the crisis that I'm in the middle of right now. Did I do something to offend God? Is there something that my sin and my rebellion did that somehow brought about this life crisis that I'm in? And while yes, sometimes sin does have, there, there are effects of sin. There's ramifications of sin. If you lie, you will probably break trust with whoever you lied to, right? It's a natural cause and effect of sin. Uh, but then there's these other realities where it's just like, hey, we live in a fallen world and, and bad things sometimes happen. Your situation may have absolutely nothing to do with sin. It might actually even not have anything to do with the, the fact that we live in a fallen world. It might have something to do with the fact that God actually wants to demonstrate power in your life, and he wants to give you a story. Do you ever think about that? The crisis that I'm in the middle of is setting God up to do something amazing, to demonstrate his kingdom in my life. So for them, though, their foundation of belief is totally wrong, but at least they're teachable, <laughs> right? They are. Disciples are like, hey, man, we might have it wrong, but if you'll teach us, uh, we're, we're ready to listen. So the first group of people, though, is these disciples. All right, let's continue on. Verse 6. So what does Jesus do? Having said this, he spit on the ground. He made some mud with the saliva, and he put it in the man's eyes. Verse 7. Go, he told them, wash in the pool of Siloam. The word means sent. So the man went and washed, and he came home seeing his neighbors and those. Uh, well, let's pause there. So he goes on off. He goes. Uh, he follows kind of all the instructions of Jesus. He goes on off, and he comes home, and he's healed. Now, this is a miracle, right? This is exciting. This is something that everyone present and anyone around should get really pumped about, really, like, jived about, right? But no one's going to. They're not because there's these cultural perspectives that are going to limit them from seeing the beautiful thing that God just did. So let's continue on. Let's look at the, the next group of people that kind of miss this beautiful thing of what God just did. Next group is his neighbors. Verse 8 says this, his neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed it was. Others said, no, it only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. Now, I love this. I, I, I think this group is hilarious because it's a group of people who are literally looking at Jesus and they're like, it looks like him. It sounds like him. And he's sitting there going, guys, it's me. And they're like, nah, no, it's not you. No, it is. It, it's, it's me. But for them, their cultural perspective that is limiting them from seeing what God is doing, it's just a spirit of unbelief. It's, it's this, this deal where they're going, the miracles don't happen. Just miracles don't happen. The impossible can't happen. It can't. And because their perspective is blind, people don't all of a sudden see, nope, can't be you. While he's sitting there going, it's me. Nope, it's not. <laughs> and maybe you know some people like this in your life. That when it comes to God, their perspective 
of unbelief is so strong, they live in denial to what is obvious and even could be right in front of them. Like God is so obviously trying to get their attention. God is working. Maybe your life story is a a, a testimony of life transformation where you're like, this is who I was and this is who I am and it's God. I'm telling you it's God. And they're like, nah, you just got better at life. (laughs) No, I'm telling you, I was a mess. Jesus saved me. Nah, (laughs) And you run into people like that. And that's this next group where their, their perspective is just the impossible. The miracles don't happen. So continue on. Verse 10. How then were your eyes open, they demanded. And he replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it in my eyes. He told me to go to Salome and wash. So I went and I washed and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. And so now we're going to run into this third group of people, which is going to be the Pharisees, okay? Verse 13, they brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received sight. He said, he put mud in my eyes, the man replied. I washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God for he does not keep the Sabbath. Now, Who are the Pharisees? The Pharisees were the keepers of the law. They were like the the best in all of their culture at following the law. And quite frankly, they were highly honored in Jewish culture. In the synagogue, in, in teaching circles, everyone would have been like, man, the Pharisees are the guys because they knew the law perfectly and they kept it perfectly. Now, once again, in Jewish culture, it's all about keeping the law. And so one of the laws that these guys refer to is the Sabbath. They say this guy seemed to have broken the Sabbath. Now, why in the world are they saying that? Okay, so the Sabbath, what's the Sabbath? The Sabbath is simply a day of rest. And so one of the 10 commandments, honor the Sabbath and keep it holy, right? Honor the Sabbath, keep it holy. So then the natural next step is to ask the question, well, what does it mean for me to honor the Sabbath and keep it holy? What what helps me know that I am committing this day to truly a day of rest and that I'm not working? And so then they ended up with questions like, help me define what is work. Like, is walking work? And they're like, well, no, we got to be able to walk. We got to be able to, you know, kind of do some things around the house, go to the bathroom, things like that. We got to be able to walk, right? Okay, but if you went on a 10-mile t- walk, that would be like work, right? Some, right? Some of you are like, no, I did 10 miles this morning. For me, 10 miles would be work, okay? So, so they would be like, yeah, that's definitely too far. So literally what they did is over time, these teachers of the law got together and they came up with something that they called oral tradition, Oral tradition is just by word of mouth, they're agreed upon standard to make sure that they were following the law. So they all agree, they put their heads together and they said, hey, this amount of distance we all agree is not work, right? And they all shake their hands. And anything beyond that, we're gonna call that work. And everyone's like, sounds good to me, let's call that. That's done. And that's oral tradition. And then another one of the things that they would say, okay, if you're sick, well, you can't go to the doctor. Because if you go to the doctor, then you're forcing him to work, and then he's going to have to, he'll help you get better, and he'll heal you. So you can't get healed on the Sabbath, because that would be work for him. And then then they look at other things, like all these people were gardeners. They all had their own gardener. They all had their own farm in some way. And so they would say, well, what about, like, if there's a weed in my garden, can I pull the weed? And they said, no, you can't pull the weed. Even though it's one weed, we're going to call that work. So no pulling of the weed. What about irrigation? Can I water my plants? No, you can't water your plants on the Sabbath. We're basically going to say, if God sends rain on the Sabbath, so be it. It's up to him. But you cannot water your garden at all. That included spitting. Any type of water, liquid on top of it, that's, he's farming. And so for them, literally, they looked at Jesus and they said, you told this guy to walk all the way to the pool of Siloam, breaking the Sabbath. You healed him, healing, breaking the Sabbath. You're gardening, breaking the Sabbath. And so they're all freaking out that Jesus is breaking the Sabbath because they broke what their perspective of the law should have been. And here's the deal is they're offended because God's not following their interpretation of the word of his word. (laughs) We never do that, right? Get offended with God because he works outside of the boundaries of how we interpret his, he should act according to his word. 
They valued their interpretation of Scripture and their oral tradition and the letter of the law, even over the heart of the law. And so they, they totally missed the fact that the guy was blind. And now they see it. They're just ticked off. They're offended. And here's the deal. It's incorrect perspectives produce incorrect deductions. Incorrect perspectives, their incorrect perspective around their oral tradition produces an incorrect deduction. What's their deduction in verse 16? This man is not from God. Not only is this man from God, it is God. But it produces an incorrect deduction because of their incorrect perspective. Perhaps some of you are around uh, in church over the last 20 to 30 years uh, as many churches went through uh, what have been almost deemed as worship wars. Uh, the churches transition from more traditional and hymns and things like that to contemporary music and things like that over, over time. Well, what, what it happened, I remember uh, people saying in our church, drums are of the devil. Well, that's just silly. Drums are not of the devil. But what, what was it? Well, they highly valued their tradition. They highly valued the, the hymn. They highly valued liturgy. And what happened is they were emotionally responding to this value over the fact that someone was worshiping God fully and genuinely, and they couldn't see that worship in another kind of setting. And so they said, they make a, a, an incorrect deduction based on uh, an incorrect uh, perspective, a cultural perspective, but not really a biblical perspective. Okay, fourth group of people who have an, a, a sad response here is the parents of the man. Verse 18, the Jews still did not believe that he had been blind and received sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one that you say was born blind? How is it that he can now see? Verse 20, we know he's our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind, but how he can see now or who opened his eyes? We don't know, ask him. He's of age, he'll speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For already the Jews had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ would be put out of the synagogues. That's why his parents said he's of age, ask him. And so here you've got the parents and their cultural perspective that is consuming them right now is fear and acceptance of their community. Fear and acceptance into the synagogue and into the community as a whole because the community as a whole, cultural community, revolved around the synagogue and revolved around worship there. And so what they're sitting there going is they're going, listen, if we say that this happened by Jesus, we're going to get kicked out of the synagogue. Thus, we're going to get kicked out of our community and we don't want that. We value that so much. And so their fear of getting kicked out actually robs them of seeing this amazing thing. Like... It, if you were the parent, don't you think you would walk up and be like, I cannot believe it. My son who was blind can now see. And you rejoice. But instead, they're like, you know, we just got to distance ourselves here. Because we want to make sure that we don't get kicked out of our community. And so they miss out on it. Their foundation is fear and a desire for acceptance. They're driving, uh, the thing that's driving them is cultural and community acceptance. None of us struggle with that, right? Acceptance, fear of what would someone else think if they were to know what God's been doing in my life. God's done something in your life, but you're afraid to tell anyone because fear, desire for acceptance. All right, final person here. Final person I want to look at is really, it's just the man himself, the blind man. Uh, check out his response in verse 24. A second time, they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God. That was their way of saying, tell the truth. It was like a, a Hebrew statement that was like a charge to tell the truth. Tell the truth, basically. They're saying, we know this man's a sinner. He says this, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see verse 32, hop down there. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Now, Here's what's really awesome about, about this guy. He, are you aware that he too carried all of the same cultural perspectives as, as everyone else in the story? 
Like he believed the same things that the disciples believed. Are you aware of that? My wife and I were talking about this. Like how, how crazy would it have been that he too, all his life would have been thinking, did I sin? Did I blow? Did my parents sin? Are they to blame? Like the whole time he's thinking these, these are like the same perspectives he's thinking. Are you, are you aware that when Jesus says, makes this mud and tells him go wash, he's thinking all the same things that all the Pharisees are thinking. He's like, oh man, I'm going to be in trouble. I'm breaking the Sabbath. This guy's breaking the Sabbath. We're participating in breaking the Sabbath. Like he's going through all these same things, all the same emotional things. And and yet at the same time, all he can come to at the final conclusion is, listen, all I know is I was blind and now I see. And surely that's from God. Like it has to be from God. But he had to deal, he too had to deal with some of these cultural perspectives. He, he had to come to the place of saying it was this guy named Jesus. And when he said that, you want to know what was happening to him as well? He's getting kicked out of the synagogue. The synagogue that he, for the very first time in his life, has the opportunity to enter. Up to this point, if you were unclean, which if you were blind and he was, was blind, he wouldn't have been able to participate in community worship in the synagogue because of that. And so now, all of a sudden, he has his sight. And guess what? He basically signs away the opportunity to be, in, to, to be accepted in culture by saying it's Jesus. It was Jesus. Cultural perspectives, blind kingdom perspective. And so many people here miss it. They all miss it. And you and I too, are you aware you're going to miss out on what God is doing, what God's about, what God wants to do in your life uh, if you don't get his perspective? If you don't line up with, God, what's your word say about this? What's your perspective about this? Let me just share some of these that my wife and I have really had kind of a complete realignment in our lives around, just so that you hear like, all right, here's some of the practical stuff. One of them, and I've shared this before, so if you've been around, you've heard it, uh, but even our our family. So we have nine kids, and and I know a lot of you are like, oh, what happened? I know, I do the same thing. (laughs) What happened? But we never intended to have nine kids. That just wasn't our plan. And we, we... we wanted to have three or four, and, and then we kept having more. And, and then at some point, we asked God, we said, God, you seem to be superseding our plans and our desires over and over and over again. But here's the thing is that we often ask a, a set of questions as parents. Uh, maybe you did this, or maybe you have done this. You ask the, the questions like, well, how many kids can I afford? How many kids can I effectively love? How, how many kids can I lead? How many kids do I want to have? Well, those are all good questions. They're just not biblical questions. So what's a biblical question counterpart to those? Instead of the, how many kids can I afford? Well, here's here's a question. How many kids can God provide for? (laughs) All of them. (laughs) Instead of how many kids can I love? The question is how many, or how many kids can God empower me to care for, to love, and to lead? Instead of how many kids would I like to have, how about this question? How many kids would God like me to have? And that's why we ended up with nine, because that's what he said. And so for us, we're, we're not like pro-large family or anything like that. We are pro-do whatever God says. But you better align your heart around what Scripture says around that subject matter. And so for a lot of us, it's just a realignment. And here's, here's the thing that I've discovered is that when you find like, when you get a, a check in your heart and you're like, man, I feel like I'm doing this wrong. The very first excuse that comes out of your mouth or question, you know, so like in the parenting one, well, how many kids can I afford? That very first question will reveal the culture, uh, what, what is building right now your belief, the cultural questions that are building your belief. They'll, those will spew out of you naturally. And so those are the ones that you need to come back to scripture and say, what does scripture say about those same things? Here's another area is is generosity, finances, and and things like that. We might ask the questions like, well, how much can I afford to give? Uh, What will I be able to afford or will I be able to afford my wants and my needs if I give these things? What what does God want really from me? And, And those are all good questions. They're just not the biblical questions. The biblical questions, instead of how much can I afford, it's what is God's standard? It's just what's God's standard of of giving. God didn't say, well, let me just give my last. He said, no, I'll give my first, my best, my one and only son. 
His standard of giving is just overly generous, off the top, over the charts. He gives his best, he gives his first. Instead of how, how will I be able to afford the things that I want, it's the question of God, would you even redefine my wants and my desires? Instead of God, what do you want, what do you want from me? Here's actually the question is, God, what do you want for me in this area of generosity? And he will just blow the lid off of it for you if you go into, if you press into those things. And, and please don't think for, for a moment, uh, I just kind of give this warning, please don't think, well, hey, if I'm a Christian, I'm more likely to make right uh, kind of just first deductions than the rest of the world in terms of this, these cultural things. No, you won't. The disciples were right in there. Notice you got the disciples who are close to Jesus and are for him. You got the Pharisees who are far from Jesus and against him. You got the, the neighbors and the parents who are indifferent and they all make wrong decisions. They all make wrong deductions based on their cultural perspective, right? So if you think, man, the disciples are more likely to get it right, no, they weren't. And if you think you're a Christian, you're more likely to get it right, no, you probably won't. Our cultural realities are so ingrained in our core that you have to bring those things to the word of God and say, God, what are you saying about these things? For us, it could be in the area of, of materialism or keeping up with the Joneses. Could be around power, promotion, uh, or glorification of your children. My, my wife and I refer to it as the worship of kids. If you're a parent, you probably fall into this cultural belief of the worship of your child. It just is reality. If you don't, it, all right, another message. Um, <laughs> political parties, control, safety. These are all subjects that we think, oh, this is God's perspective, where no, it might be your perspective. You think about even safe. I, I don't want to live there because I want to be in this safe place. You want to know the safest place for you is in the will of the Lord. That is the safest place. If it's in the ghetto and that's the will, man, you are safer there than in the suburbs. I promise you. Think about King David. King David, uh, when he fell, he was in what appeared to be a very safe place. He was at home as opposed to at war. But the scripture starts by saying, at the times when the kings go off to war, who's David? He is the, he's the king. Where is he supposed to be? At war. That's the will of the Lord. He's outside the will of the Lord, and so he doesn't have the grace of God to handle the battle that he's about to face, the battle he wasn't supposed to face, which was this temptation with Bathsheba. So he's in an unsafe place because he's outside the will of the Lord. The safest place for you is with wherever God's calling you. So we, we have to ask these questions. God, what are you doing? What does scripture say about this subject? This thing that is this belief that's so central to my core. It's, it's why I do what I do. It's why in some cultures they don't sit on concrete. It's just become so ingrained that they're unaware. And I would argue that there's a lot of it in our own lives that's so ingrained in who we are that if you were to come back to the word of God and say, God, what does your word say about this? And how would you redefine me? How would you help me get a kingdom perspective? Man, he would start building a whole different perspective in your mind as opposed to what, what you currently perhaps are believing. So let's just close here in prayer. Because I believe that there's some things the Lord's just going to bring to the forefront of your mind right now that are out of whack. Heavenly Father, we just come before your throne. I ask that your spirit would do what your spirit can do, and that is reveal in each one of us what's the first thing that we need to deal with that's out of alignment right now with your kingdom perspective. It's just become so ingrained, so comfortable in our culture, and we've bought into it, and it is not biblical. It's not your perspective. And actually, I'm missing out on your kingdom realities because of this cultural belief that I'm buying, that I'm living, that I'm behaving within. So Lord, I pray that you would just bring that thing right now to the forefront of my mind, then help me to commit to dive into scripture to see what is your heart? What's the scriptural principles around this subject and that my beliefs would be defined by your kingdom realities and by the word of God and not by the culture in which I was born or what everyone else is saying. I believe, God, that we are meant to be a people that represent your kingdom, and the only way that we will represent your kingdom is if we understand the perspectives of your kingdom in all things. So lead us into that and help us to live it. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said Amen. Amen. We got prayer partners back here who would love to pray with you if you have any prayer needs. Otherwise, be blessed. Have a great, great Sunday.